So just to give you a teeny bit of background on me, because some of you don't know me, I'm a former vice president of Autumn. There are three laws that started this business in the United States. Most of you know by Dole. Stevenson Weidler did the federal laboratories and small business innovation research did the small companies and so on. Joe Allen was the staffer who did by Dole. I did SBIR and Stevenson Weidler. Later on, I went into hands-on work. I've been on all sides of this field. I've been written legislation, I've written policy. I ran the office at the University of Rhode Island for a while, ran a company, been a serial entrepreneur, high-tech entrepreneur. And I like to say jokingly, I've seen it as a man and as a woman as well. So it gives me kind of a unique perspective. That's the track record of my company uh, as of 2015. So you can see we've dealt with tens of thousands of technologies and billions of dollars of successful licensing and commercialization work. So hopefully I know something a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. So I want to start out about talking about sort of thematically with what we're doing here about dominant designs. I don't know how many of you, you know, we never apply what we do ourselves to ourselves. It's an interesting dilemma. So let's look at what we do with some market research when we apply it to ourselves. There's this notion of the dominant design. And in the photograph here, we know that in the early stages of an industry, there's lots of product innovation. And after a while, a dominant design emerges and it sort of the product innovation slows down and process innovation takes off after that. So my example here is dugout canoes. I used to represent archaeologists in Washington also. So in prehistory, somebody wanted to get across a river, they jumped on a log and paddled with their hands. And after a while, they said, there's got to be a better way so you don't get so wet. And they started hollowing out canoes. Now, one of the wonderful things about rep representing archaeologists in Washington, D.C., is you get to be a tourist in wonderful ways. And I got to take a stone axe and actually try to hollow out a canoe. And after about 15 minutes, I realized I'd be there for the next three years. But somebody made a great process innovation when they saw lightning hit a tree or whatever, and it burned out the inside. And so what they would do, uh, the Native Americans, is pour coals down in cracks from fires burn out the inside, and then they were just shaping it after that. That's process innovation. We see the same thing here. I don't know how many of you remember building your own computers. Anybody other than me old enough to? OK, there's a few of us who were probably engineers. So what's the history of the personal computer? The history of the personal computer is there was a guy at Intel who was lazy. He wanted to go off on vacation, and he had to get this chip out. And he's like, oh, I'm never going to get it done before vacation. I'll tell you what, I'll make it so they can program it themselves, necessity being the mother of invention. What happened was a bunch of people then said, hey, we can take this chip, pull components out of rack mounts, and make computers. We'll take the screen from the oscilloscope, we'll take this, we'll take some memory from here, and they made computers. And then they started throwing them in these boxes that look like this, which is how we used to transport rack mount uh, equipment, and that was called a K-Pro or a Compact, and those were the early luggable computers. And of course, what's happened over time, this dominant design has continued with lots and lots of process innovation. And what happens is after a while, there's so much innovation that occurs on the process side that the features and functionalities begin to transform and you get a disruptive innovation. And in this case, to get to this iPhone, there were two key disruptive innovations. The first one was we pulled the wires. And the second one was the internet, obviously. And it changed the whole nature of what we do with devices and how those devices are used in society. And if we know the dominant design, we can very quickly figure out a bunch of things. We can figure out the price. Because there are prices for that equipment, or that piece of technology, or that drug, and everything is related to what people are used to paying for that. If you're making an adjunct for a vaccine, if the vaccine is priced at X, you know the adjunct can only be Y. If you're making a component that goes in a computer, or you're doing a touch screen, well then the touch screen can't cost more than the original screen plus the keyboard. 
so we can quickly estimate price. And we also know, depending upon the kind of innovation it is, how many customers we're going to have. Radical, uh, incremental innovations don't change much. So you're not bringing new customers into the marketplace. But if you're bringing new functionalities, and then there's a reason for people who weren't in the marketplace to come into the marketplace. And obviously, disruptive technologies just throw the whole game out the wall because they change everything. And we can see this even in when we look at the S-curve, we can begin to look at how we look towards the future by who's the early adopters in the tech transfer business. The early adopters, the innovators were primarily in the US, some in Europe. And then it spread from there. We crossed the chasm, so to speak. And we could see how it adopted. And so the same kind of things that we look at for market research, we can do on our own profession. That's the point I'm trying to drive across here. And we can also look at what the market forces and the market barriers are. And I'm uh, curious if anybody knows what the single most important market force for technology transfer is. Taxpayer dollars. The willingness of governments to support us. Universities and research anywhere you go in the world do not survive without taxpayer dollars. We are dependent on taxpayer dollars. When I first went to DC, an old curmudgeon pulled me aside. Back at that point, he said, son. And he said, you know what this is all about? And I said, no, Norm, what's it all about? And he said, jobs. Never forget it's about jobs. And in fact, if we think about how we look at tech transfer, it's really about jobs too, ultimately. That's because we're defended on government money. And of course, needs are dynamic, technologies are dynamic, and there's always competition out there. So just like we see in industry, things change over time. The technologies have a trajectory, and there's new approaches coming in. You walk through this conference. It's a wonderful, I, this is, by the way, you know, I go around the world. I've spoke at a number of conferences. This is my favorite conference of all conferences. And you're very fortunate to be here. You have three things going for you. First of all, the venues are fun, and people make sure you get to enjoy the venue, as opposed to sitting, those of you who went to Autumn got to sit in a ecologically unsound area in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is, you know, after probably Poughkeepsie, New York, one of the great pits of America. Uh, here, you're in beautiful cities. Secondly, it's small enough you can actually talk to people and have meaningful conversations. And third, the food is good. So, and the people are wonderful, of course. But anyways, we have competition and we understand that. So let's look at how tech transfer got in the mess that we're in today. This is a guy you probably don't recognize. His name's Vanover Bush. He was President Roosevelt's science advisor. First science advisor of, in the world, in the US, or in the US rather. First science advisor in the US. And he had a model and his model worked well. So what he did during World War II is he locked up a bunch of scientists in an ivory tower, so to speak. Actually, it was a room in Chicago. And they made some inventions, and they tossed it over the transom. And that transom was the United States Army. And they took it, and they dropped it on the Japanese. It's called the atomic bomb, and it worked. And he said, this is a great model. This is how we'll rebuild American industry. So he started the National Science Foundation at the end of the war. He was the major advocate of that. And he was the first advocate for tech transfer in the US of the modern times. We had a system that was very different that's worth looking at called the Ag Research Service. Agricultural technology transfer was a different model and that goes back to the 1800s in the US. But anyways, it was this lock them up, throw it over the transom, drop it down and we win. But it didn't work. And this, by the way, was back, you know, in the 60s, there were these books like Rembrandt's in the Attic. It's like, oh, the IP's good. It's important. We've got secrets in the university that are going to save the economy. Except for nobody wanted it. So they said, we'll do by dole, then they'll want it. Except for nobody wanted it. And they said, we'll do SBIR. That was my legislation. We said, well, the wrong companies are picking it up. We need small companies who are the innovators. And that helped a little bit, but still nobody wanted it. 
And thus we end up in the situation where we are today, which is no matter how successful somebody is, I just sat through a presentation from Yism, which was interesting. They have 10,000 technologies of which 900 were licensed. Now think about that. You're in a company. I have 10,000 products of which we sold 900. Big success. It's shameful. Think about your office. How many of you have an office that is wildly profitable without a big hit? Ah, most of us lose money for the researchers. We're in a university trying to help the researchers and we're losing money so we are a net drain on the resources of the university. No wonder people write articles about the problem with tech transfer from the other side. Think about some of the ways we think. We are like, oh, look at we put all this money into this. We have paid money for this. And we should recoup that money, recoup the patent expenses in the US, whatever you're recouping here. We want a licensing fee for this. In industry, that's called a sunk cost. Nobody cares. You put that money out, that's your problem, not my problem. So we have this model that is fundamentally flawed based upon the assumption that we have something really special. Now, I'm not denying that there are important special things out there. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm trying to help you understand the political perception of the model and the reality of the world we're moving in. This model, which is supply side based, we call it in the US trickle down economics, Licensing based, money centric, is based on something that is extrinsic to the basic mission of the university. Because the fundamental mission of the university is to create and disseminate knowledge. Now Europeans have been much better than the US because you believe in knowledge dissemination. In the US we believe in selling IP. But nonetheless, what's happened is as the world has changed, we know we've seen this because we talk about all the technologies out there that everybody has and all these marketplaces for it. We've gone from Rembrandts in the attic to watermelons by the truckload. So even the technology is no longer special and unique. We are selling commodities. Every now and then there's a fundamental breakthrough. That's the exception to the rule. But otherwise, what we're selling are commodities. And this is what's driving the crisis in technology transfer. And there are some trends to suggest that disruption is occurring. The first one is we're losing money. It's not a problem to lose money if you're supposed to lose money. We talk about charities. Charities are not supposed to make money. They're supposed to lose money. But when we talk about the university tech transfer office as a way to generate revenue from the university, we've bought into a flawed model. Secondly, most technology is not licensed or transferred. And even YISM, when you look at YISM, which is a very successful operation, is making its money primarily off sponsored research, was my understanding from his answer to my question, which is true in the US too. I will give you a data point to help you understand. I had the unusual experience of being married to somebody whose father was a Buffett billionaire. And what he did was he would take pool, if you've ever heard of Business Wire, it's a press service, he founded Business Wire, sold it to Warren. He would take pools of $100 million, invest 50, give away the other 50, and this is how he kept it rolling. And he rebuilt the University of Washington, much of Stanford, actually Hebrew, he gave money to a bunch of universities. He supports, he's a great man. He, you know, he, he walk in this room, you wouldn't know you were sitting with a billionaire. Actually, he's not a billionaire. He's given away about 970 million so far. I never knew what you would do with money till I met him. You give it away, it's a lot of fun. Anyways, the reality is one of his donations is more than Stanford makes in a year with all its licensing. So if we're focusing on money, we're doing it wrong. Which suggests that we have a wrong focus for what we're doing as we move forward. 
There are some other things that indicate we have problems with the model. We're talking about express licensing, easy access. What are these? These are low revenue generating models that are quick and easy to get the stuff out. Well, again, if we're counting hits, licensing deals, and we're counting money, that does not make that much sense. We talk about doing open source licensing, which makes even less sense. And in this light, it's interesting. My company does a lot of work for NASA and the US government. I got to tell you, working for NASA is the most fun I've ever had in my life. If you want interesting toys, work for NASA. It turns out almost all NASA inventions generate nothing. First of all, in the US government, anything written can't be copyrighted, which includes software code. The most important innovation that ever came out of NASA is not Tang, which is actually not NASA. It's something called the Huang Kyung transform, which is like a Fourier transform, only both the sensor and the object can be moving, and that was given away. So NASA this is an example of, if you want to have an impact, give the stuff away. We talk about spin-outs and student entrepreneurship. This is, has nothing to do with the traditional model of technology transfer. We are adapting. This is good. We are adapting. But we are adapting because the situation is changing. We talk about incubators, accelerators. And then there's all this ecosystem building and socioeconomic development and the triple helix and all this kind of stuff, which is all good. That goes back to jobs. But we don't focus on that. That's an afterthought. And if you don't think it's an afterthought, think about how many of you, raise your hand if your university's primary metrics are how well you align with UN priorities, EU priorities, or your country's social priorities. One. I rest, so you see the point. Now. There are other models. The real action in technology transfer is not in the US and not in Europe. It's in Asia. It's really exciting. I'm a senior advisor. My retirement hobby is being a senior advisor to the president of King Mongkut's University of Technology, Tanburi, which almost none of you have heard of. If you've heard of it, I'll be very happy. But at King Mongkut, excuse me for one second, I'm getting dry. So among my other accomplishments, I am one of the longest survivors of a bone marrow transplant for leukemia. I was transplanted in 89, and one of the consequences is I don't make tears and I have a dry mouth. So my advice is stay away from whole body radiation. I'm sure you didn't need me to tell you that. Anyways, we're working on a really interesting model here. King Monkuts happens to be one of the leading technology universities in Asia, and we are something like one of our external advisors said in a meeting, I've been looking for this data to validate it, that we're something like number 33 in the world in industrial sponsorship. And the reason we have so much industrial sponsorship is we have a very different model than what's happening in the West. The model is they're doing service projects, stuff that in your university you would look at and say, not worth our time. Why are we making a better GIS system for the government? Or why are we helping? We actually have a pilot, a certified pilot production facility for drugs on campus. So when you get these kind of third world drugs, we can actually manufacture them, get them out there. That exists in industry already in the West. In Thailand, it doesn't exist. So these service projects are very important because not only do they link us with industry needs already, our faculty understand industry very well, but the fundamental research now grows out of what we're doing connected with society and industry. We don't worry about how do we connect these two because they're already connected. And if you think about it, when we go back in Western history, we go, oh, where did the, you know, the laws of thermodynamics come from, the steam engine, where did SNIRA come from? Oh, it came from making a purple violet or something like this. So this is a model that actually is supposed to work. And that is actually how the US Agricultural Resurface 
research service worked under the Morrell Act. They would put people out who were the interface between the researchers and the farmers to translate for each other, and, and the needs flew, uh, drove back and forth. So you begin to see that there's other models out there, CAST in Korea is an example of this, which have nothing to do with licensing, but have massive amounts of knowledge transfer and can be remarkably successful. The trick is to institutionalize these, and that's not to say we in the West don't have a lot to offer them, because there's a lot of skills we have, and they have no idea how to deal with uh, the global economy and the way that we're used to dealing with it and so on. But my point is simply that we need to sort of get outside of our box. Okay, let's look at what else is happening. Some of you may be familiar with Porter's Five Forces. When we say, why is IP important? I'm going to basically make the argument that IP is not important for tech transfer. So I'm just letting you. We know it's important because IP eliminates the threat of new entrants, right? Monopolies. Increases the bargaining power of the supplier because they have something that nobody else has. And you can cut back on the threat of substitute products and so on. Except for when there's a glut of IP in the world, it doesn't work. So IP becomes increasingly devalued. And now we have this interesting phenomenon that's happening in the age of artificial intelligence with deep convergence which is a field I understand something about because I used to be a nerd. What philosophers do when they go to do research, and they don't want to be a philosopher anymore, is you do artificial intelligence. So that's what my research was in. So I used to get funded in this. So before I explain how this works, I have to explain how you really value IP from a corporate standpoint. And this is not how the corporate lawyers or the people who negotiate with you evaluate IP or how you evaluate IP. Because we make a horrible mistake. We evaluate the, or we value IP based upon its impact on the income statement. Stop and think about that. There is only an impact on the income statement when something is actually sold. That's why we have running royalties, right? And we are estimating what running royalties may be, but you may never do it. So why are we evaluating it that way? There's a lot of unnecessary assumptions in a discounted cash flow. What we're really doing is we're evaluating an intangible asset. Where are intangible assets? On the balance sheet. So why are we using an income statement-based evaluation for something that's on the balance sheet? So how do you evaluate or how do you value an IP on the balance sheet? By the way, I'm not saying don't use these traditional methods because there's uh, a thing called a P-beauty contest in game theory, probability of beauty, and it basically says if everybody else thinks that's the right way to do it, you might as well do it that way too. You know, because it's too hard to re-educate everybody. But what's really going on from a corporate standpoint is this. I can say from where I am today to some point in the future, I have a trajectory. If I develop this all internally, I'll get to market then. If I license your IP, I change my trajectory. That's called, and I actually make time value of money doing that, and, and it gives me strategic flexibility. That's called the present value of the growth opportunity. So and the interesting thing about PVGO is whenever a major firm in a technology-intensive industry has a big breakthrough or they buy a big portfolio, there's volatility in the stock price. Anybody play the market in here? Raise your hand if you play the market. Uh, see, in America, we'd have more market players. If you play the market and you don't have a lot of money, you play what's called stock options. And one of the major inputs into a stock option price is volatility. So you can actually measure the impact of a technology by the likely volatility on stock prices in the industry those raise the option values, and thus, if the company acquires it and immediately sells stock options, those options are worth more today than they were yesterday. So there is a monetary basis that is rational for saying this is the value of this technology on the income statement. So we're talking about, which we know, of course, technology gives us flexibility and it gives us options. 
What's happening with the impact of deep convergence? First thing is we have a reduction in value due to the number of alternatives around there in the world, because everybody's developing things in their universities now, and it's easier to design around. You set up the computer the same way it learns to play Go or chess better than a, humor, a human, is you let it look at what's going on and it figures out a design around for you. And you get around existing patents. That reduces the value of your technology as IP. Not as a tool for making money, but as IP. And it's important we differentiate this too because we know we do know-how licensing. We know we can make money off of or move to industry technologies that are not patented. By the way, know-how licensing is of course the er licensing because the er kind of IP is trade secret. Just don't tell anybody. That's what it's all based upon. You've heard the phrase secret sauce. Anybody know where secret sauce comes from? You know what the first patent in history was? It was a patent in a Greek city, I think it was in Italy, and they gave, the, the people in the city gave a person who developed a sauce for food a patent so other restaurants could use it and pay a royalty for using it. So there is actually a historical basis for the term secret sauce. Anyways, here's an example of a design around. This is a sputtering technology that came out of the University of Rochester. Uh, and it turns out there's 20,000 ways to do this. So, you know, it's an interesting technology. But if you didn't license theirs, you could have licensed somebody else's and ended up roughly in the same place. The second thing is we have more and more, as we saw in the first day when the gentleman was talking up here, the, the product cycles are happening faster. Faster the product cycle, the less time you have to uh, recoup the expense, hence the lower the value of the IP. And trade secret begins to become less important because the assumption with trade secret is it's too expensive to figure it out on your own. But in deep convergence, that's not the case. You push the button on the machine, you set it up, and it goes, do, do, and, it goes and does this. This is a technology we helped to license, which is a NASA technology called recursive hierarchical segmentation. A lot of the NASA stuff in imaging goes into the medical field, and this was cancer cell detection. It was originally developed for telling the heights of waves from space. In my favorite way, it's all collapsing. Any of you know the monkey case? Some of you do? This is, this is fascinating. This British uh, photographer goes out in the wild, sets up a camera, and a monkey takes a selfie. National Geographic prints it. He's like, what? You took me. Intellectual property there. You got to pay me for it. And they're like, no, the monkey took it. You just set up the camera. In other words, you need human technique, a technique, a method to have intellectual property. Just like you can't patent a law of nature. What happens, and then uh, uh, PETA goes out and says, well, the monkey owns it then. And the US Patent Office and the US courts agreed that no, objects of nature don't any own anything. Now think about what happens as computers are increasingly used to help us in invention. You push the button in deep convergence, you have no idea how it's doing it. It's doing it on its own. There's no human technique. It is not clear that invention is patentable. The more you have computer-aided invention, the less likely it is, barring some major shift in intellectual property law, that you can patent these things. So the more we base our profession on how we work with intellectual property as opposed to applicable knowledge, the worse off we are. We are now in a world where we're dealing with commodities. And we need to think about how we change our behavior 
to deal with commodities. And what that says is money can no longer be a metric. And we might as well bite the bullet and get out of the money business. Because the more we stay in the money business, the more we set ourselves up for political disaster. And if you don't think you're doing it, look at what, I mean, you and Europe are moving in the, unfortunately, I feel sorry for you, sort of in the direction that we moved in the United States, where you have blithering idiots running the country who don't care about science. In fact, they're anti-science. And they don't care about any of this stuff. And the reason they get away with that is because people are hurting. What people don't understand overseas is why Donald, I'll give you a concrete example. I'm a volunteer firefighter. I just moved from a county in Mendocino. I lived in a county with 400 people in 100 square miles. That was my fire district. When it rained, the telephones didn't work because the lines had been put in under rural electrification and AT&T refused to fix them, stating explicitly before county commissioners and other hearings, well, it's too expensive to fix it. And the state of California did nothing and the federal government did nothing and people were mad because you know what happens when it rains? You can't call the fire department. So when grandma has a heart attack, you have to drive to somebody on the fire department who has a radio. And 400 people don't live on top of each other. My nearest neighbor was three miles away. That means if they have to drive to me, that person's dead by the time I get there with my AED. That's why Donald Trump won. Because there was this split between life in the cities and life in rural areas, and we have this electoral college. And that's why you have these problems with populism in Italy and other places. Because we've bifurcated the rich and poor. And those of us who have read our Aristotle recognize in the, in the politics, he says this, if the gap between the rich and the poor gets too big, you get chaos in a country or in a city. And that's what's happening. So we need to view licensing not as a money factor, but just as a leading indicator of likely social impact. And so we have to shift to measuring impact. So my suggestion as we move forward is we start looking at how we tie what we do to acknowledged and widely accepted social goals and track it. This technology contributes to that. This technology contributes to that. And we look for, for what lack of a better term I call ripple effects. So if you get multi, like when you're skipping stones, if it just goes in once, you get some ripple. If it skips a bunch of times, you get a lot of ripple. All of a sudden, it's better sometimes to have multiple licensees than a single licensee. You wouldn't think that way if you were looking for money, usually. So we have to start shifting our paradigms to adapt to what's going on in the world. And all of a sudden, the nice thing about us, we are more intrinsically linked to the mission of a university we can become more important rather than less important. And it's not like we're doing dramatically different things because it's very exciting to walk around your meeting and listen to people talking about student entrepreneurship and how you're helping uh, small companies and this, that, and the other thing. A lot of this stuff is, is the same, but the paradigm shifts. And that's what happens with disruptive innovation. So we need to encourage disruptive innovation inside technology transfer in order to adapt to the changing environment that we are in. And with that, I am done. So I thank you for your patience and tolerance, and uh, I apologize for not being more entertaining, but I put this together this morning. So thank you. <laughs>